Hello viewers of Off The Pitch with TK. We're back and I can't believe we're already on season three. And uh, thank you very much for supporting season one and season two. We appreciate the feedback you are giving us. We appreciate the subscriptions you are, you are giving the channel, sharing the channel, the comments you are giving us, they help us to improve uh, the show. Please continue to share, subscribe and comment. Today in studio, I'm joined by a humble guy, a good defender, a calm guy on the pitch, but we, we are, we're going to find out today how he is off the pitch. I'm joined by a former Mamelodi Sundowns and Santos FC defender, Wayne Arense. Wayne Arense, welcome to Off the Pitch with TK Season 3. How are you, my brother? I'm good, man. Thanks, TK, for having me. Good, good. How's life been lately? Yeah, it's good. Um, obviously, I'm still at it, so keeping fit. You know, it's in the jeans, training every day. So, yeah, dropping mm -hmm. the kids at school and, yeah, okay. still keeping fit. Thanks, man. Look, uh, when this is a show uh, off the pitch with TK, we just uh, focus on off the pitch uh, uh, dynamics of the footballer's life. Mm -hmm. The aim of the show is to educate uh, and advise the current players and also inform the supporters because sometimes they don't, they, they tend to judge players mm -hmm. without having the actual information of what the players go through because we only get to see you guys on match day. And match day is the final product. There are a lot of things that go through in the yeah. footballer's life. So this is the show we are just sharing the experience of the footballer's life, where he came from, teams he played for, how was life, off the pitch, and, and so on. So first of all, we are grateful for you to join us. And uh, look, I've, I've sent you an invite and you didn't give me trouble. You just say, let me know when and what time. And I give you a date and time when you arrived. And for that, I appreciate that. Way. No, anytime, man. Thanks, man. Uh, when I'm going to start from the beginning, where I will believe most people maybe not most, but me, I started seeing you at Santos FC. Where does Wayne come from and how do you get to Santos FC? Yeah, it all started, um, obviously, I think any kid, when he sees the ball or some sport activity, they get involved. Uh, I started getting involved in school. It was athletics, it was cricket, and then it was soccer, all the codes, because you had your seasons and Whatever, if it was winter, you know, it's soccer. In, the, in January, summer, you had athletics. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, started all sporting codes, but eventually soccer just it, it pulled me a little bit. And my dad was involved with, with Kenwin Football Club. Mm -hmm. And he, he used to, he was a treasurer there. Eh? And I thought, okay, let me join Kenwin. And then they, they emerged with Parkus and became Ken Park. And then I started playing there, I think I was under 12 or, yeah. And I started playing. And yeah, from there, I had a love of it. And that time, um, we played in the district. Mm -hmm. We had the district teams and Santos joined the district. And I was at Ken Park and I remember we playing the one game against Santos and we just gave them a hard time. I think we beat them that game 1-0. Mm -hmm. Um, and, the coach, he, he liked the, the, my presence at the back and, and he approached me and he said, if I want to join Santos, mm. that was still junior. And you didn't think anything of it. Obviously you saw Santos playing in the PSL and, and obviously you want to see how it's like at another club because you were playing at the amateur team and you yeah, someone on Santos approaching you and you still playing in the junior league. And then I said, okay, yeah, let me go. And, and that's where it started. Mm. Yeah. And then when you went to Santos, uh, did you get the trial or you went there and they signed the first team already or you went to development? No, obviously I started with, with the development and there was no contracts involved because that time you just wanted to play. Yeah. And just want to, you know, you want to be associated with, with the best teams. Um, yeah, I joined Santos, um, and the 19 team. Mm. Um, we played in the Bale tournament, Metropolitan Cup. Yeah. And then from there, um, we normally play, um, friendly games with the first team. And that's how the coaches can also pick up certain youngsters. Mm. And I remember we playing against, um, the first team mm. that was in Bala. Um, I saw Otieno, I saw Bucks. So, Idris Burton, you know, yeah. and 
they, they didn't hold back in the tackles. Mm. They didn't hold back. And, yes. I, and obviously, we also, we wanted to prove. And then we played, we played, and just Roger Desar was still there. Mm. And, and Pubi Solomon as well. And then they approached David Natwani, and then they obviously he coached the, the Vodacom League, and they said they should bring me up to the Vodacom team. Mm. Um, and then from there, I played Vodacom, and then that's when the, the contracts started to talk, and they said I must play in the Vodacom League, a league a bit more competitive and more tougher. And I think that helped uh, development and also um, us playing against the first team because obviously you see those guys on TV and you also want to be where they are. So yeah. I think that all helped and we moved from stages to stages and moved to the Vodacom team. We did well there and, when I, and then I signed the first team contract, but I was still playing in, in the Vodacom. But obviously, with constant communication from the senior guys telling me, no, keep doing what you're doing, um, work on your game because eventually you must come the side, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. Um, obviously, you, you, you listen. And I, I think that was a key, key, key point for me where you listen from your experienced players because, I mean, they also want to rub off the experience to the younger generation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happened. And from there, I took a step up to the first team. Mm. And, and when you get to the first team, how old were you when you signed the, the first team contract? When I signed the first team contract, I think I was, I was 20, mm. or 19, 20. Yeah, because yeah. I was still in school. Mm. Yeah, I was, I was still in the grade. No, I think I was 18 because I signed, played for Vodacom League mm. and I signed the first team contract. Mm. But then they said I must still play Vodacom. Mm. But obviously, when you, when you sign at time and you, you already feel part of, of, of the team because they're looking at the future. Yeah. So, yeah, it was around about 18, 19, around there. And at that time now, you just signed a first team contract, you're 18, 19. What happens to school? Are you still able to go to school or now you must choose between school and football? No, I, I think it was very clear um, because um, I think I was... I matriculated, yeah, and then it was just just to get the schooling done. And obviously, within the the contract, obviously parents wanted me to study further, but at the same time, also wanted to train with the team because they're on a full time basis. But w when I matriculated, I did a year in HR, I did an HR course, mm -hmm. and then after that, whilst doing the course, I trained in the afternoon, and it started becoming that I should be training more because they wanted me at the first team. Mm. But I still did the course of my, my HR course. And then obviously I trained and then I ended up being full-time and that's when I joined the first team on a full-time basis, yeah. Okay. After my year course. And most players will say, when you sign the first team contract first time, it's not a, you don't, you don't look at the money. You just want to be a professional player, you want to play in PSL. Yeah. Did you get to engage Santos about the, the deal they were giving you, signing one fee and the salary or were they talks? Did they have an agent or who was negotiating this deal for you? No, because when I first signed, it was just my father and my mother was there. I didn't have agent because you just wanted to play. And yeah. there's no talks about negotiations about this and that because that time you were playing for fun. Yeah. And here someone's going to give you an incentive to have fun, mm. to do what you love doing. Yeah. And you're just saying, okay, let's play. And where do I sign, you know? Yeah. And just because obviously, um, Kulam Al Ali he helped me in that department where they gave me, um, I could study after matric mm. and, you know, and afterwards we can, as things go on, we can, go full time. So yeah, everything was just, there was no negotiation. It was just, we're going to give you that. And as you progress and we'll talk again and then. Yeah. Yeah. And, and but at that time, Santos was not a small team. I mean, they, yeah. they, were, they were the biggest team in Cape Town because Ajax and what they were not, they were Hellenic and, and, and Santos. Yeah. And Cape Town Cape Town Spurs. Spurs, yeah. So. It was Ajax that time. Yes. And, and Santos, I mean, they had a sponsor. It was Angel Santos or something. Yeah. 
So you still remember your first contract, how much was it worth in terms of your monthly salary or the signing on fee? Yeah, obviously at that time, uh, the first contract was about, I think about 20K. Mm. Yeah, and then, yeah, it was about it, very first one. And I mean, signing with a, because obviously the, the Vodacom contract, mm. that was that was about 8,000, I think. Yeah. But when you sign the, the, the first team when I joined full time training every day, it was about 20k. And I mean, you still a youngster, you have no responsibilities yeah. and what. Yeah. And yeah, it's very grateful. And yeah, it started there and very grateful with Santos. Um, that's where I learned a lot of things um, from the owner to the players, former players. And yeah. Mm. No, that look. It was a it was a good deal. Trust me. Um, I, I spoke to a couple of guys who did ten pro at bigger teams. They were never as start. They were never close to that bigger. Now you get to the Santos team at that time. It has Musa Otieno, it mm. has John Bitso, Mark Ipia. I don't know if Sebastian Bax was there. Or he came yeah, later. I was there. And uh, Sipon Zuzo. You are still a youngster, right? Now, how did you adjust? To fight for a position because you were eventually regular at Santos. Mm. How, who helped you, or how did you get to acclimatize that? Now I need to fight and be in the team. As much as they are senior and experienced players, I need to find my way up to to also be a regular in this team. Mm. How did you find the challenge of saying now I must work hard and be in the first team? Yeah, obviously, um, you you, you look at what, what your senior players doing, and obviously. You don't expect to just come in and take the position. You got to learn and learn from the coaches and also from the senior players within the team. And for me, it was all about, it was just an honor to be a part of it. And because I always had the people in my ear, because I can remember, um, I had what Pax was telling me, um, you're a good player and keep working hard because we can see on training and then, you, you yourself will realize and, and Idris Burton also coming to me and he's saying, listen, this is what you must do. And all those things, they're talking in your ear. Mm. So then you also think, oh, so they see what I'm doing mm. and what you're doing is not in vain because if they can pick it up and ensure and then other people can also recognize and that gives you encouragement and to say, oh, they recognize what I'm doing. And when the chance come, I'm, I should just be ready. And that's what the coaches have told me, Roger Desa. He said, just keep on playing, just push, push, because when the chance comes, you need to be ready. Yeah. And I think um, I trained, I gave my 100% every day on training. And when the chance eventually came, yeah, I took it. Yeah. And, and now, you were in the team that won the Bob C final. When Clive Parker was Clive Parker the coach, well, you were not in that no, team. No, I wasn't in the team. You were not in that team. Yeah. Okay, now you are in this team, you are a first team player. You start to earn money, a big money that you never earn. Mm -hmm. Most youngsters, when they get to that state of saying, I'm, I'm a regular in the team, everybody recognizes me when I walk in the mall, I've got the money. How did, how did you handle it off the pitch in terms of saying, I've got money, I'm a regular, I'm popular now in the hood? How did you keep it together? Not to, we never read about uh, Santos youngster, AWOL, Santos youngster mm -hmm. came into training ground. Uh, what what did what mechanism did you apply so that you stayed in the line even though you had the money and you were first team player? Yeah, obviously you, you you have your guidance from start from home, um, where you know you had your parents advising you as well, and also your your own knowledge also because you pick up the certain things and you know, and I don't know for for me since when I just signed I always. Because we moved out of, I said in Mitchell's Spain, and my mother then bought the property in, in Kales River. Mm. And then they started building there and they built a bigger house and in a better area. And obviously, you pick those things up uh, as, a, as a youngster and see what they also doing for, for the kids, for, you know. So I think it rubbed off. Um, I don't know, I was, I just wanted my, to buy property. Um, I think when I was Santos, um, I bought my first property uh, and 
my mother, she also helped me with that, my father as well. He like, said, no, okay, if you want to do this and then find out, first find out this and that. And, you know, and, and I think that's where it started is, is at home where you get the guidance and people around you, your agent as well, mm. they can guide you about this and that. And it's all about listening and taking information and finding out and, you know. Yeah. yeah. So at that time, you did you, have, did you buy your first car before the property or your property first and then car after? No, obviously I was one of those lucky ones that uh, received the car on his 21st birthday. My parents bought me a car. Yeah. Uh, it was that time your Toyota Tez was still the popular car. Yeah. That time. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I got the car and then obviously eventually, um, you know, you, 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 you tempted to buy a, 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 a better car, you know, as mm. time goes on. Um, I think I, I bought the property first and then afterwards I, I bought me a, a car for. Mm. Yeah, that time Golf 4 was in and then put me a Golf 4 GTI. But yeah, it was all with, with, within the boundaries because yeah. I never bought me a new car though. Because, mm. you know, um, I still had a discipline to say, okay, um, I need to do this and not that. And okay, I can afford this and you know. And But then I bought a property and I never stayed in the property. Yeah. Uh, bought a property and I... Just rented it out because I figured what am I going to do when loading the property and I had a room there at home and yeah, I just bought it and I rented it out and I think that was the, just the trigger for me to, to do something in those lines. Yeah. So you will say for a youngster to stay in lane, also the family background needs to be good and surround himself with good advice and he must also apply his mind to know what's right what's wrong yeah definitely obviously you need to find out that people like especially your elderly people and your parents or your agent you know you need to find out about these things about if you're not sure and need clarity about different steps you want to take advice you know and i mean people's the the internet is full of these things, I mean, yeah. how to invest or what to do, you know. So, there's always things you can find out as just the individual itself, he needs to speak out. And if, because if you don't speak, other people won't know. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's out there. And if you don't speak, um, no one will know. Yeah. So now, eventually, 2011, 2012, Santos get relegated. Am I right? Yeah. And you and Eliza Rogers moved to Mamilo de Sundance. How did the move come about? Yeah, obviously, um, we were playing in the playoffs. Um, I can remember, but that time there was no rumors about me joining anybody or nothing like that. Obviously, you're just playing your heart out. You want to save the status, Santo status. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. Um, the following day or the in the week, mm. you just heard that um, Sundowns is interested and in me and Elazar, and obviously I was shocked because mm. you know you were your boy from Cape Town and yeah, Sundowns is calling, mm. and I mean Sundowns calls. You pick up the phone yeah. and you say, when do I come? Yeah. You know, so yeah, it was, it was a big thing. It was because people were saying, I'm not going to play. Mm. Uh, you know, Cape Town people, they don't make it in Joburg. That was the trend then. Yeah. Cape Townians don't make it in Johannesburg. And, um, obviously I, I looked at the people who was there. You had Surprise Moriri, Nandoro, Teko Modise. Household name in, in South Africa. So for me to rub shoulders with these guys, it, it just shows that you're also one of the, one of the top players in the country. Mm. And I said, no, let me give it a challenge because in the day you're in this business to to improve and to play with the best, and you know. Mm. And I said, no, um, if they need me, I'll, I'll 
oblige. Yeah. And yeah, and I told Elazar, listen, yeah, because we were talking, you know. Yeah. And I said, no, let's go inside now. These people, is, they're always up there and you can see the type of football they're playing and, you know, I can only make us better players, mm. you know. And yeah, we ended up coming um, to Johannesburg same day and we stayed together and yeah, we, we ended up training and we met up with them in the preseason camp and yeah, it started from there. Yeah, at, but at that time when you hear Sundowns is after you guys, who makes the call? Is it your agent? Is it Santos management or is Sundowns management calling you? Yeah, uh, then at that time I had an agent mm. and then my agent was always in talks and then, and I said, okay, yeah, Sundowns. And, and then I remember having a meeting with Sundowns management, it blew down and yeah, my agent said, listen, uh, this is what they're offering you. And obviously it was better money and you're coming now to Johannesburg, this is where it's at and you know, and I thought, okay, let me give this a try. Let me give it a go. And it was a good experience for me to just be in Janus because, because this is where it's at and all the teams on the other side. And yeah, it started there. My agent did everything and then, yeah, we relocated. Yeah. And then you get to Sundown's team that is made of superstars by that time already. Mm. You are coming from a team that has just been relegated. How is your confidence when you get there and how is the treatment from the guys that you find there? No, oh, it was surprising me. It was when we came because they were on preseason because we, we played in the playoffs. So um, the coach gave us another week off and then we came there and everybody greeted us like they came out of their way to greet us. Mm. And I just felt very relaxed. I felt at home. Um, felt no, it's, it's actually nice, you know, mm. um, and obviously we had, um, I think Israel who came up to us and he also introduced himself, but obviously we knew he, who he was and, mm. and then he was a club captain, you know. So yeah, the, the welcoming was good. Um, coming to San everybody was friendly, helpful. So yeah, everything started off very well. Yeah. And who was the coach at the time? Uh, I think Johan Neskens. Oh, Johan Neskens. Yeah, he was the coach at Sundown. Yeah. yeah. And was he just arrived by then or what? He was there six months? Before? No, he, yeah, he was there already. And yeah. obviously, because um, he spoke with me as well. And then he was sitting at the boardroom and he was, he was there as well, speaking and yeah. Saying about talking about the team, how do you want the players to play and how he thinks I can do and mm -hmm. you know. So I also felt like um no man at least the coach was speaking to me and took time out to, to say about the team and how does he want the team to play and you know. So you mm -hmm. can also have an idea of how and what to do when you arrive at training and so I felt more relaxed and at the same time obviously waiting for that first training session, you know. Yeah. But yeah, it was good and good experience. Yeah. And, and how was Nisken as a coach? Obviously, you could see the the European mentality that he had and the style of play that he wanted to play. And it was different from the training sessions as well, the small specific training sessions that we had. And you could see that it's it's a step up, basically, because that's why um, he played for Barcelona and he mm. coached in Europe, you know. And so, yeah, I, I really, I really picked that up when I was there. Um, the training sessions we had, and yeah, it was all experience for me that I was gaining, and it can only improve my game. So, yeah, I took it in, and and I adapted well. Yeah. And and eventually around that time, the team is not doing well. Um, I think the last match of Nieskens, if I'm not mistaken, you were playing against Swallows at Dobsonville. And I think that's the last match he was coaching. The fans were after his blood. Mm. How do you guys as players off the pitch now? Because 
you leave the pitch, camera sweeps off. Now it's you guys in the dressing room. You see the fans are after the coach's blood. You as players, how do you feel and what does that do to you mentally? When you see your own supporters who must support you, now they are against you. Yeah, obviously you, you feel a bit sore and disappointed because at the end of the day, you, you do all these things during the week, what the coach wants you to do. But at the end of the day, when it comes in the pitch, you're not performing. Um, and I think the supporters doesn't see that factor because the coach can't get on the field and pass the ball for you or put the ball in the back of the net. And I think um, we as players, we, we let the coach down. You feel that sense of you you're letting someone down. Um, because I remember there was games that we had to win and we drew and then we lost, you know. It was just a rough time at that time. And especially that's the time when I when I also came. And obviously you as a player you also feel that we also need to do something. And I remember surprise having a talk, Ezra having a talk with us in the change room, see guys, we need to pick up our game and we need to do better, you know. Um, yeah, we obviously we, we, we fought, we fought, we tried, and unfortunately, we, um, in essence, left. Mm. Um, but obviously, you yourself as a player and as a team, you look in the mirror and you say what you can do better. Mm. And yeah, I think everybody reflected and they, mm. they, they knew that they, they weren't up to scratch. And yeah, unfortunately, you left then, but mm. you know, we, we got a new coach now. So would you say it's easy for players to go in a depression mode, especially when the team is not doing well? Is it frustrating, stressing? Can you easily go into depression? Yeah, obviously it's frustrating because uh, it's because some maybe you haven't won in in your last two or three games. Now automatically you one no ahead, and now you want to cling onto that that three points it becomes. You know, now you start being desperate, you know. Um, all the tactics goes out of the head. You, you want to keep on. And, and then all of a sudden you get a sucker punch where people equalize or, you know, and then that sense of, ah, here we go again. You know, so I think this puts you down, but obviously I wouldn't say you get depressed because you, you you need to deal with these things and obviously you have players around you to talk to and your coaches will also say talk to you and obviously help you through those processes. Mm. So I think it's 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 how you deal with it. Um you also need to look at your own game, see where you where you can improve yourself before you even can rectify how someone else. So I think yeah it's lots of um learning points on the pitch as well as off the pitch. So, because then you need to reflect because maybe what you're doing off the pitch is reflecting on the pitch. Mm -hmm. So I think um, the players also had a look at themselves because obviously you had those incidents where people was not performing on the pitch, but then the fact is it's contributing, it's outside the pitch, it's causing them to have such performances, you know. Mm. So it's all those small factors that you need to look into. Yeah. And at that time, how were the equals at Sundowns? Because, I mean, a big team with big stars, I mean, big money, driving big cars, they should be equals somewhere, somewhere. Yeah, I, was, I didn't pick up those egos because, like I said, when we came there, everybody was friendly, you know. Yeah. But you had your big players there. But for me, it was... If they had egos, they probably kept it to themselves or mm. kept it in. Um, but for me, everybody got along well. And mm. you, you could see that you, you had a big team because you had your techos, surprises, Mandoros. They're always, they're always the ones that are talking and wanted to do better. And, you know, so there was no egos where I could say that this one, who are sitting alone in the changing room, you know, mm. I never picked that up. So for me, I, my stay at Sundowns was was a good experience and I met good friends, some um, quality players and yeah, mm. good role models as well.
and and Sundowns is, is one of the teams that pay good bonuses for wins. I'm sure by then, when you guys are not doing well, not winning, you keep on saying, there goes our bonuses again. Also, for sure, when you sit around and talk, say, guys, we need to win, yes, for the team, but it's also financially we are losing us. Yeah, exactly, because at the end of the day, this is your job, and you need to perform at your job. So at the same time, we wanted to win. Uh, I just... It just didn't click. It just didn't come at that time. Um, I think um, it was probably a phase that we went through that, that time where it was very difficult. Um, but eventually, um, as things got better and better, we got out of it. But I think um, any team goes through a, a phase like that and it just matter of years being professional and stick to the principles of the coach, what he wants, and you know, and also you as self as individual, what you do on training as well as outside the gates. Mm. Now, mid-season sundowns is at the bottom. Pito Musimane comes through. You still remember his first meeting with the team when he arrived? Yeah, I remember we sitting in the, in the boardroom and at sundowns and um, President Patrice Motsepe, he spoke to us and said we have a new coach and you know, everything was just silent. Like there was nothing in the media about possible coaches coming and what, what. And, mm. and all of a sudden he introduced Putzo and he came walking in and I'm like, oh, he has the former Bofana Bofana yeah. coach, the assistant coach. And yeah, and I remember he he was the one who called me up as well mm. for Bafana camp and obviously mm. you're looking at now as a new guy um, coming to take the helm. So obviously he came with his ways of wanting to play and how he wanted things done and, and you could see um, the first, I think he came the first six months, he just wanted to get into the team and just try and just get the team back up, get the confidence going and everything. And I remember um, we, we they were at the first season with Eden Charger, we, we came up, we climbed up and we just ended up in the top eight. Mm. And I thought, okay, we're getting momentum, it's coming now. And yeah, he came in and everybody was excited and happy to have him on board. Yeah. And, and at the time, it, it, it was believed that he brought a different mentality in terms of work ethics, because it's been said Nieskan was a good coach, but he was lenient and soft towards most players, especially off the pitch. And Pito came with a different mentality to say, even if, even if you are not in the team or not playing, you are at home, you feel like you are at work. Now, how, how true is that? But it's just a rumor. Yeah, no, I think that guy's work ethic is on another level. Mm. Thing is obsessed about winning. He he demands um, the best out of everyone, whether you're a player, whether you look after the pitch, whether you're working in the kitchen, preparing the food he, in the office, whatever. He he wanted everybody to give the A game, and you could see how he transformed everything. He, he started off with with the kitchen and change the, he had um, people giving out different diets. He had people coming in, preparing food, um, different diets, uh, you know, because obviously you're burning a lot of energy and after training you eat properly. And he instilled that professionalism in the players where you need to eat properly in the morning. You come and have your cereal at the club, you must have breakfast because you need that energy to go into training and after training you need to eat again and you could see that things are changing at the club you started off with, with your small things that that you people normally take for granted you say ah yeah, just have a coffee or yeah. you know but you used to say that there's breakfast there after training there's there's a proper meal and now you could see that hey, things are changing now even with the, the pitch the grass it might have to be like carpet, you know, he used to be on the 
groundsman's head there. You need to get this right. Why is this like this? You know, mm. you demanded everybody to give the hundred percent, and I think when you see that, it rubs off because he was that kind of coach where he just wanted the best out of you. You think he's shouting at you, but he knows why he's shouting because he knows you better than that, and you can give more. Mm. So I think when I pick that up, you can see it, things are changing at the club. You can feel the, the atmosphere, the vibe. And I think that's where it all started, that people don't really see those small things where he he makes a team sit in the boardroom, he watches your friendly games, your post games and of the opponent as well. And, you know, those small things, it helps you as an individual and also when it helps you, it helps the team. Yeah. So I think those are the small details that instilled in the players and the rub from everybody in the club. Hmm. So, a, a coach like Coach Pizzo, also, what difference does he bring to a player off the pitch? Besides on the pitch, when you see a player playing, off the pitch, what difference does he bring to a player? Yeah, obviously, he brings that that belief in, in you as well, that self-confidence. He, he, he'll tell you, no, you're better than that, you know. And it rubs off. It, it, I mean, he, he it gives you confidence as well. Mm. And obviously, he was always advising the guys about to buy your house, you know, those, those small things that, that, that you you don't hear from other coaches maybe or you never heard it before, whatever the case may be. But he brings that mentality in you, that winning mentality and always wanting to do better for yourself, not just for yourself, but also for your family as well. So I think... Um, that also played a big role. Yeah. He, he encouraged the players, like, you guys, you're getting this type of money and you're getting bonuses. Put it away. Buy you, buy you a house, you know. Leave this big cars and those things. So he brought that and also the, the winning mentality because whatever you want to do, you want to do it the best of your ability. Whether yeah. it's in business somewhere, you want to do it the better than the, you want to be the best at it, you know? Mm. So, yeah, he brought that, that mentality and I think that rubbed off in the club because the club's DNA is just about winning now. Mm. And if, they, if there's no trophy that they picked up, it's a problem. Mm. So now the club has that, that DNA where everybody has that winning mentality within them. And when you join Sundowns, you know that Silver was waiting and, you know, you demanded to give the best. So, yeah, I think he installed that in the club and as well as in the players. Yeah. And and, and after Pizzo took over at Sundowns, we started hearing more about the analysis of your opponents, yeah. the analysis of your own players. And if there's one coach who started hearing that he can break down an, an opponent, and by, by him saying that or listening to him say that you can already tell his players are prepared because they know what to expect. How, how important is this thing of players sitting in a boardroom and watching on projectors, analysis and tactics, and critically also, uh, how do I call it, being criticized, but for a good cause to say, uh, Wayne, this is how you played in the last game, these were your errors, and if you do this and so on. How important is that? Because sometimes footballers think it's all about inside the four lines, but they don't know there's a weight behind yeah. the four lines. No, obviously I think that's, that's important because when you play, you get get used to something, you, it just becomes a norm. You, maybe you made a mistake, but you're not aware that you made a mistake. Mm -hmm. So that's where when you watch your game, you'll see it, yeah, I'm doing the same thing, doing the same mistake every you now two games, three games in a row. So when you watch, you, you see yourself because when you come in a situation again, what to do and how to to turn your body, you know, those sorts of things. And I think it, it helps. It helps the player and it also helps the team because when you do analysis watching other guys play, you probably you probably don't even know that this guy, the striker, is a left footer. Now you're defending, you're defending and you're just covering his right foot and leaving his left foot open. 
And but when you watch the game, you see, ah, oh, this guy just uses his left foot. So if I close his left foot, uh, he won't use his right foot because he's mm. strictly left. And it helps you mm. in your game as well because it makes your job easier as well. So if you can close uh, one area, then you know because you watch his game, and then then he's limited as well because now he also needs to change. So you basically one foot step ahead. Mm. So it helps definitely. It helps because. You, you, you're learning about the opponent. Oh, he likes doing this. So I need to do that. So obviously those things help and how the team plays, um, which areas are they, they, the strengths where they more likely to, to, to utilize. So yeah, we do all those things and definitely helps because if we used to get homework, uh, watching your games and watching the opponents play and it definitely helps us because it shows because yeah. we, we ended up winning all those trophies and yeah, it helped the team, it helped the players and eventually things just follow after that success just came. Mm. And, and, and this homework activity, how does it work? They give you a task and then you must come and present what you saw, what you learned and, and so on. How does it work out? You go analyze yourself and then you come and give feedback in, yeah. in the boardroom. Yeah, I think um, you get the game. And you watch the game, but, and obviously watching your positions as well, your game and also the team. So when you see probably there in the 35th minute or whatever, 10th minute, hey, I could have done that. You know, you write it down and so that you can see, okay, if I had to do that, then you come in and explain, tell the coach, okay, I see the 10th minute. Um, I did this, but if I should have done that, open my body up and this I could have done that better and better and avoided that situation you know so if I give a point and then the, probably the guy before you said no if I had to do that I wouldn't have even ended up that side you know so it becomes a, a talking thing and topic we're talking about the game we're talking about you know it becomes a conversation you know where everybody's talking and saying oh I should have been there and we, I think to do better in the next game if he goes there and I stay here, you know, everybody's interacting. So you're talking about the game, it's like you're having a conversation mm -hmm. and but at the same time you're improving um, not just outside on the pitch kicking but also your mentality. Your mentality. Yeah, because in the day you can't just go on the field and kick. You need to think about the game. Hey, am I in the right position? Um, is this okay? You know, talk to the fellow players. So I think definitely helps. And I think that's why, um, you see everybody doing video analysis now yeah, and yeah. it becomes a modern thing. People are recruiting more video analysis guys. Um, you know, we, but also when he came there, he recruited another three guys. And yeah, it's just because just to help the team and also help the coach and the players itself. Yeah. So, in modern football, besides being a talented young boy from Ekasi or wherever, you need to be coachable and understand the dynamics of the team. Yeah, no, 100% because sometimes you can be the best player, but if you don't follow tactics or whatever, it's going to be, it's going to be a problem because now the team is doing a pressing exercise and probably you're not pressing and it's going to that's going to be the, the weak link in the chain, basically. So obviously you need to be coachable. You need to listen and take instructions, how to play, when to press, when not to press, you know, you need to know the game, You're just not kicking the ball and running. So it becomes more about reading the game now, um, know what the coach wants, when to do it and how to do it, what areas of the pitch to do it, you know. So it becomes more about thinking as well, as well as your talent is there, but the same, you need to balance the two out because at the end of the day, it's not just about you using your talent. You need to think as well. So I think um, you need to be coachable, also listen and also ask if you don't know. Yeah. There's one thing that I often hear supporters asking about them, asking themselves, in fact, so I've got you here, I'm going to ask you. Um, Sundowns is known for the so-called slow centre-backs. 
But surprisingly, you are never outrun by anybody. I've, I've seen you appearing with Scoot, I've seen you appearing with Tabo and Tate, I've seen you appearing with um, Sumaila, a couple of guys. Even now, yeah. I mean, Ricardo is not a fan. Yeah. But you guys, you are never outrun by these fast <laughs> strikers. How do you guys get it right? Because most supporters, they say, they have got slow defense. Why are they not running over them? And mm. How do you guys get it right? Yeah, obviously, um, that's also when the, when the team trains, you, 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 you work together as a team because obviously it's a team sport and, you know, then the one goes, you're covering the one and, you know, you, and it's always communication and, and those sort of things. But I think at the end of the day, it's, it's about you looking at your opponent, you know, you're playing someone that is quick and, you know, uh, where to position yourself. You're looking at the guy. Oh, he likes to make this type of run. He likes to do this. You position yourself in a way so that you can counter what he likes doing. And also about reading the game. Mm -hmm. I think when putting yourself in proper positions, talking to your fellow defenders, bringing him inside, you know, being compact. That's why people are saying you need to be compact, you know, yeah. because obviously when you fall apart, you... You're easily breakable. You're easily breakable, yeah. Mm. So I think that, that was our thing when at Sundowns where when we attack, we attack as a team, we defend, we defend as a team. Yeah. Always compact, keeping speaking to your fellow players, you know, everybody speaking because there we had lots of captains within the team. Um so I think that yeah, it was easier for for, for the team because you could read the game well. And also you communicated and yeah, it start, everything starts on training. Um, because yeah. you always maybe when we're defending, we're always defending with the quick guys as well. When you had your Keegan Tolly on the opposite side and Percy Tau, when we train, we train that way. Yeah. Um, when we defend, we defend uh, with our quick players come up earlier. And then, so our training, we already adapting. Yeah. So when it comes in the game, it's, it's a bit easier because we did this all week because you were running with Dolly, you were running with Karma. But when it's in the game, it's the other way around because yeah. now they're running that way and, you know, yeah. in the same team. So we do it on training as well. You always put yourself up with the quickest guys in the team, yeah. whether it's a throw at training or 2v2, you know, maybe the two center backs is up against Tapelo, the quickest guys in the team, yeah. you know, you're running with them, competing. So you know that, hey, these guys are one of the quickest in the league. So once you can keep up with them, mm. it makes your job also easier. Yeah. yeah. So, so training with quality players also helps. Yeah. And also, yeah, it helps. And also with the quick ones, you know, mm -hmm. Pagamani Slambia, he was, he's very quick. And obviously, even if he beats you on training, but you was, okay, next time, you know, and you know what to do. And you know, you can, you're only improving your own game. Yes. So when it comes to time to work, it's a little bit easier and yeah, it's you just use your experience as well. True. Look, in South Africa, Chiefs Pirates, it's a big deal, no doubt about it. But we supporters still feel a sundowns versus pirates, sundowns versus chiefs. It's a grudge match. <laughs> During that week, when you know this weekend is Chiefs or Pirates, as players, what's going through your mind? Yeah, obviously you I know that there's two big clubs also competing in the other history behind everything and the the media hyping the games up. Yeah. You know, because now you'll see it on TV, you'll see it on the media, social media that this is the game the weekend that everybody will be watching. And obviously you yourself, you get all the psyched up because you know that everybody's going to watch and it's good players all around. Yeah. And yes, but at the end of the day, um, I remember um, Pats was saying, if we can win all the other games yeah. and lose to Chiefs and Pirates, we'll still win the league. Yeah. You know, um, but at the end of the day, it's not like that you want to win yeah. Chiefs or Pirates or whatever, because you know, the supporters, because they're sitting in the stands, you know, yeah. they have this thing with other supporters. So then they, you're doing it for yourself, but also for, for the club and the supporters out there. 
And obviously, you as a professional, you know that these games often comes up and you, you obviously you're nervous a little bit. But once the whistle goes, I mean, everything just goes yeah. down and it's, it's just 11 v 11 on the pitch and you're just playing and yeah, you're enjoying yourself and everything around you is just it must go on the sport, the shouting, or whatever. But at the end of the day, you know what you're there for. You're professional, and yeah, you just need to do the best you can that day. Mm. Yeah, yeah, just to tap on that statement, where people say we don't need to beat Chiefs to win the league. Uh, we know Peter is a good tactician, good coach that this country has ever produced, and he is also very good with mind games because he gets under the opponent's skin before you can even get to the pitch. But we both know if there's two teams you didn't want to lose or you hate losing against it's Chiefs and Pirates. Uh -huh. Take me through Peter's mind in a dressing room after you guys just lost to either Chiefs or Pirates. We, we've seen in the press post, post what you will say, what you will do. But now he's in the boardroom, with, in, the, in the dressing room with you guys and he just lost to one of these two. How is the mood and what is he saying? How is his reaction? Yeah, obviously he is upset because he doesn't like losing any game. Mm. And obviously you can see it uh, from his face, but actions as well. And obviously you as players, because when there's big games, you wanna you wanna be on top, you wanna win the game. And obviously we all disappointed, but at the end of the day, we, he is upset. But I would say there's a moment where he calms himself down, and obviously then you you'll say, okay, guys, let's focus on the next one. You'll start encouraging again and try to pick up the players because. As much as he wanted to win, he also knows that the players also wanted to win. Yeah. And obviously, he'll have a go at us. And just to, because to make you feel that, um, that we have lost. And because it's not okay to lose. In his books, it's not okay to lose because you need to feel it also a bit so that you can also pick yourself up and just say, okay, the next one I'm going to do better, you know? So I think he had that way away he would hammer the players and give a good go. But at the same time, the next day on training, we say, guys, okay, yeah. um, we know the next one now and what we do and what it and now he starts picking up the players again, you know, and those. So he was very good at that, but you can see whether it's Chiefs or whether it's a friendly or whatever, the guy doesn't like losing. Yeah. So we knew that. And like I said before, that thing that rubs off me because whether it's a friendly or whatever, you want to win and you want to do things proper so that when you see things work, it becomes a norm and becomes a habit and you're doing it every time, you're scoring goals, you're winning, it becomes part of your, your identity, your DNA, as how you, how Sundowns plays, as how they, how, how we win games, you know? So you come accustomed to it. If you do something on a regular, you're winning, you're winning. So then it just stays with you. And mm. that, I think that's where you instill that in his players and the team. Yeah. And, and you travel with Sundowns uh, across the African continent. How was the experience playing in Africa? Yeah, I was here. Um, experience was, some places was different. It was, some places was a nightmare. Uh, mm. The pitches was bad the food and, you know, but then we, we got accustomed to this thing about, you know, when you go there, um, be prepared to not to have a nice pitch where we train on, it must be, it's going to be bumpy, you know, those sort of things. Um, it's going to be a lot. Um, the food is not up to scratch, you know, those sort of things that you used to here in South Africa. Yeah. And also makes you realize that we privilege the side um, to have such good grounds to train on, um, facilities that we have, but yet we still complain about small things. But when you go out there and you see what, what Africa is about, where, you know, it also makes you appreciate where you are at and just to, to help you give that extra bit, man, when you're at home, just to encourage also um, people that you think it's tough here, yeah, but wait till you go outside there. So it was tough, but I think 
Um, we prepare for it mm. as as we enter different Champions League every year. You prepare, you know, oh, we're going there. It's going to be like this, and you know, and then things becomes better and better as time goes on because yeah. you know what to expect when you're going. Which trip would you say was the worst that you can think of in terms of traveling, food, or treatment in general? Is there one particular trip that you remember that that was the worst experience? I think there's one trip we went to, I think it's Congo. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we flew, we arrived in Congo, but then we still had another six hour bus drive. Mm -hmm. It took us to some village, and it was just. You're already tired of the flight and then you must still drive for six hours and the bus wasn't also best of buses. Uh, no air con, you must put up the, open the window, but the air coming in is also hot. Mm. So yeah, I think that that was the one, um, the Congo trip. Um, but those are all experience that, that you take in because you prepare yourself for, for the future mm. and how you come there, the, the the chef is not ready with the food, you know, and you're waiting, waiting. When the food finally comes, you see it's not up to scratch, you know. So it's all things that 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 we learn and that we obviously we spoke about. The coaches will tell us, hey guys, you must prepare yourself. You're going there, you're going there, you know. So it's all experience that you learn as a player at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. And are there trips that you guys made and you'll take your own food from South Africa? Yeah, obviously, because some players would, would have their own shakes, you know, or whether it's your nutrition shakes or whatever, energy bars, whatever. You probably have your, your odd snack here and there because you know, you don't know what to expect, where we're going, you know. Yeah. Um, so, but we try and take your, your food with, but obviously the, the hotel also gives you your, the food. But like I said, you, you just need it to adapt. Yeah. Because or, or would you rather travel with a chef than, than food? Have you traveled with a, somebody who's going to cook when you get that side or it doesn't happen? There was a, a time that we traveled with a chef, yeah. We traveled with a chef and just to oversee what's happening there. and um, That was when in the early stages as well. Mm -hmm. But obviously, with years going on, you 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 learn, and then afterwards we send people in advance. Like say, instance, we're playing this week. Um, someone already went last week to go see the hotel, go see the food, where the rooms go, and check what's happening, where's the buses. So we had people in place, the logistics to do all the logistics for us. So because, like I said, you learn. So we never knew this before, and then we started ex experiencing those things, and then we we learned. Um, but so used to send the team through uh, maybe two weeks before or three weeks. Okay, check the hotel. Is the food okay? Is, is there Wi-Fi? Um, where are we training? Look at the pitch. Are we traveling? Is the bus okay? You know. Then we had those things in place. And then it became a bit easier, you know, mm -hmm. because they are the guys who go out there, look at the hotel, see different hotels, food, the distance we need to travel, you know. Then that's how also things improved. Mm -hmm. And we saw this happening as the players. And because now you can see, okay, the, the management over bringing their part, they trying to get us the best hotels. Um, if there's a direct flight or the easiest route that we can fly to, you know. So obviously we just need to bring our game, yeah. our, our game as well on the day. So yeah, we appreciated all those small things, whether it's maybe a, a charter flight flying straight, you know. So yeah, the, eventually we improved in different departments. And like I said, it, it wasn't just on the field where things needed to it improved in, in the management office, mm. they improved their things and it rubbed off in the club. Mm. And I think Pitzo brought that to, to the team and to the club where don't just go about um, business as usual. Set your standard. Um, if you're used to the standard, um, set the standard. If you're used to um, five star, then why go drop yourself now to two star, one star? Mm. You know what I'm saying? 
So set your standard if you you still good standards and then why must you drop your standard? Mm. Keep that bar up there and I think that is the thing that that I think he brought at Sundowns and he, the bar is always up there. Mm. When you join Sundowns as in the management team or as a coach or player, you must know that when you come here the bar is up there and you need to to reach that ball or go higher. Yeah. Let's talk about the game. Sandam Hama, a lovely five not yet Lucas Moriti. How did you guys prepare for that game? Maybe obvious you prepared to win, but maybe the score was a bonus, I'm not sure. Mm. <laughs> if it was planned. What went uh, during the week? How did you guys prepare for that game? Because everything looks perfect on that day. Yeah, obviously, um when you play those North African teams, Egypt, when you go to Morocco, we always play at nine. Nine o'clock at night, or eight thirty late games, mm. and those people never play in the afternoon. Mm. And so if you always ask yourself why and what what, and then they say no, they don't like the heat and the sun, you know, because it's hot that side. They're not used to playing in the afternoon, mm. and the knowing that this is a big team, I won the championship numerous times, the Champions League, and you know, and obviously our video analysis, they, they pick up all these things, um, the dynamics, the, the game and, um, what time to play those teams when, when you, when you're playing West African teams, they're the people that, that likes the afternoon games again, you know, now you play them on the, in the evening and on the wet pitch. But with our Ali, we said, okay, we're playing them at three because Pretoria's altitude, it's going to eat them and it's going to be hot and it's going to be in our favor and we're used to this weather and and we need to capitalize. And yeah, um, on the day, the football guards was on our side. They, yeah. It was nice and hot. Um, stadium was packed. Everything was just going for us. Um, you even saw in, in the warm-up, um, because when you're warming up on the one side, you're seeking other team. Mm. Always some, they're drinking water or they're throwing water over their heads and yeah. we're buzzing this side, we're warming up. Yeah. But you all, you're seeing that, you hey, really see that hey, they people, need water. They, they need water. And yeah, and we started, we started just house on fire. Everybody was pressing, pressing. It's like there's a demon in everybody. Everybody just wanted the ball and you could see that that sense that we're on top of them. And we, yeah. when, when you have the hand, like Putz said, when, when you, when you have that squeeze, you must just keep it. Mm. And yeah, I think that, that I remember we coming into the change room. Everybody was, this was a half time, eh? Everybody was psyched up and say, come on guys. Yeah, we've got them. You know, that thing was driving in the changing room. And yeah, that day it was just, everything was falling for us. Um, mm. the ball was falling and, he was hitting the pack of the net. And yeah. And he opened the scoring that, that day. He scored the first goal. I scored the second goal. He scored yeah. the second goal. Yeah. 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 scored the second one. And, um, I, I remember watching, um, their clubs, how they, how they defend the set pieces because obviously that's the only time I get up in that field mm. part of the area. And I thought, okay, let me not get in the mix. Let me give myself distance so that they can run onto the ball and and let them just try and focus on the players and then yeah I, I gave me that that run up that I had and I went like tried to keep the line and I managed to come through and yeah you score yeah. so yeah it was a memorable game and obviously it was one of the biggest defeats I hardly ever got mm. and when we beat them um I kind of knew that five no, uh, it's done. Mm. But obviously you need to be humble because, and tell yourself that you scored five, they can also score five at home because this is a big team as well. Mm. Um, we knew that job isn't done, but at the end of the day, obviously you going five no up, you know that you probably so much as I have it in, in the, Back of your 
in your hand. So yeah, I think it was one of the better games we played and mm. still memorable. And the second leg of the Champions League final also you went on the second leg leading 3-0 from home. How was the, the moment when you guys get to Cairo on match day and doing pitch inspection, those lasers, and how are those lasers affecting you? Because we see them from TV, say, are they affecting players? How important are they to the opponent and supporters? How was the feeling um, in terms of the nerves? I mean, you are leading 3 nil, but you walk out of the dressing room to do pitch inspection. Cairo Stadium is buzzing. Mm. Yeah, obviously you're coming out there and uh, supporters on top of you. Um, because now we're just looking at the pitch, but at the same time, you're looking at the people around, they're going on, the throwing flares in the air and fireworks going off and lasers in your face. And for you, it's, uh, it's something different. It's, it's just another experience and you're taking it in, you know, you, and people, guys were on their phones, look, recording the whole thing because you don't see this in South Africa where the flares are going up and lasers and all this. Mm. And it was just something different that you're taking and just obviously you, you're enjoying the occasion, but you know, 90 minutes in, of the, when the whistle starts and that then everything changes because then it's 11 v 11. Yeah. And obviously, um, the coach had a chat to us and obviously he said, guys, obviously let's forget about that now. Once we start playing, it's everybody switch on, you know, those sort of things. So, I think the group of players we had, um, they, they, they experienced all those things and it, it was good and they, we adapted well because at the same time, you also wanted to show those fans what we're about. Mm. And I think at the end of the day, they got accustomed to, to sundowns because, I mean, you can always, any big team, whether it's Vidat, Zamalek, Satif, Al Ali, they they will they know who Sundowns is, mm. and I think um, we we brought that, um, and because obviously they also loved the way we played football and brought the flair to them. You know they were more organized team, but when South African teams has more flair, um, quicker players, you know, and they enjoyed that part of the game. And with our game that we brought, um, they ended up also liking our style of play and yeah it was just the experience that we all took in and that that we are accustomed to now mm. and and after being crowned champions how was the mood in the dressing room to the hotel and all that did you guys already switch to one that we are the african champions what was going through your mind yeah after the game obviously it was big celebrations and Taking photos, you know, Champions League winners, you know, and now everything falls in place because now you're winning a Champions League and you can only imagine what's happening at home. Mm. And obviously, we got to the hotel, everybody was celebrating there, but that was it. Mm. And then, because our people wasn't there, like, the, we wanted to share this with all of Africa. Mm. They could only see from TV and we're sending photos, you know, video calling, but we wanted to bring it back home and yeah. show the country. And obviously, um, for us as players, we, we couldn't wait to get back. And when we arrived at the airport, it was, I never saw that before. Um, we had to let all the other passengers go first. Mm. We had escorts taking us through another area of the of the okay. airport and it was just something else. We couldn't move at the airport. We had the Minister of Sports, we had you know, we had our president, Mr. Matsepe. Everybody was just there to congratulate us and the media was there. It was just buzzing and and it all just sunk in like wow. Yeah. This thing that we done was big. Yeah. Um, because you realize then how big this this competition is, and then later on 
people's congratulating you, phoning you for interviews. You're like, wow, this thing that you done is big. Mm. It's not just for you personally and the club, but mm. for the country, you're putting us South Africa on the map because now you won the Champions League. The next stop is FIFA World Cup. Mm. So, yeah, it was just everything we had to take in very quick because then again, you had the legals on the other hand because, yeah. you know, you had to play in a league game and a league to win. So it was all a lot of that you had to take in, but all very good experiences and memories that you'll never forget. Yeah. Mm. And, and before we get to the Club World Cup, how was the bonus after winning the Champions League? <laughs> yeah, obviously uh, the money is always good because then you add your exchange rate to the dollar to the rand. Yeah. So obviously it was good money. Obviously that was the incentive. And for you that traveling eight hour flights and then you have bus drive for six hours. Yeah. All that sacrifices it paid off because mm. people think always, ah, nice, they're going fly there, they're playing that side, enjoying it's nice. It's not always the case because sometimes you just don't feel like being on the flight. Mm. And then now all of a sudden you're going eight hour flight and then come there, hotel. And I think all those things it adds up. At the end of the day, when you win the trophy, uh, you get rewarded. And yeah. yeah, obviously the incentive was played a good uh, part of it. But yeah, it was that also just encouraged you to go do more. And to go further and to do better and to improve. So yeah, I think that was the rewarding part as well. Yeah. And let's go to the Club World Cup. How was the experience when you guys got the when you treated as the big team, when you recognized as the Africa champion, and overall your learnings from the Club World Cup? Yeah, obviously you get um when you in the World Cup, you know. You obviously they know who you are because you won the champions in your continent, the Champions League in your continent. So already you regarded as the big team there and obviously they treated everybody the same. And I remember coming to the airport in Japan, we had people waiting for us. We had buses, we had escorts. Everything was to the T. I think um the, the way they ran, they ran the FIFA Club World Cup is, is just something we can take out, um, how to run major competitions, you know, we getting the team, getting them on time, getting them at the hotel on time, you know, making sure that the team must look after everything is in place. The food is proper food, the hotel is right. Everything is, everything was on time. Yeah. I mean, if, if we're going to leave at three, huh, we're leaving at three. Everything was a run to the tee and they looked after us well. Every, in the changing room, you come in, everything was well. You had your security. This is all run through FIFA at the club World Cup. Your fridges was full of water, power, aid, whatever you needed. Everything was there. And you just feel like, oh, you now amongst the best as well, because mm. at the end of the day, we knew that we in the same competition as Real Madrid. Mm. So, and you see the billboards there of all the teams. You see, you'll see our logo there alongside Madrid and other top teams as well. And just it gave you that oh, you also, you're doing something right. Mm. And yeah, it was just an honor and a privilege to be in the World Cup. And obviously, we've learned a lot going out there out of the World Cup, but the experience we take out of it. And yeah, it's something that we've learned. And also, you, you take home to your country as well, also, and you share those experiences as well. Yeah. And, and did you guys get to meet the Real Madrid players or the team while you were there, or you left before they arrived? Yeah, we left before they arrived because. I think they came in the semi-final stages. Um, we got knocked out before that. And then, yeah, we, we, I think we, we watched the game. Yeah, we watched one game, but we never saw them personally and you get to meet them and, you know, so, 
but just knowing the fact that we also competed in the same tournament as them, mm. um, everything was to the T and yeah, just an experience that you can only learn from mm. and also try to improve by your, yourself and also the club to see what is happening and how other teams do things. So yeah, it was just one good experience. Yeah. And, and now when you, you thought you've been to the best games, Club World Cup, you come back, you guys are playing against Barcelona, against Messi. How was the game and how was the nerves knowing that I'm up, I'm up, up against Lionel Messi tonight? Yeah, obviously that game it was something else. I think uh, we never expected uh, the president to to get us a game like that, but obviously heads off to him, he made it possible. He thought that bringing Barcelona here, playing with us and, you know, it's just not for the team, but also for the, for the country, mm -hmm. also with the supporters out there so that they can get to see your Suarez, Messi, mm -hmm. you know, Xavi, if they're in front of you on the pitch, because mm -hmm. you only used to see him on the TV. So, um, for us as players, it was more excitement than nerves. Obviously, you're nervous, but you're also excited. Um, so, yeah, it was one of those experiences that you every you don't even need to tell people to watch or yeah. everybody know they're going to come to the stadium or they're watching, you know. It's just it's for you just to take in the experience and just to enjoy it. And I think that's what we did because even the coach, he said also... Um, He's going to let everybody play. Mm. Um, he's going to make wholesale changes um, just so everybody be on the pitch mm. so that they can play, you know, because the experience is that you don't get to play every day. So I think he played his role. He brought everybody on. Um, um, fortunate for me, I was the only guy who played the 90 minutes in the game. Yeah, yeah because obviously... Ricardo got ill and then I played the full game and yeah, it was experience that I think everybody will remember. Um, in the years to come, they probably have pictures in the archives and mm. yeah. Did you have any conversation with, with Messi that night? Not really a conversation because it was all about just when the game was done, I just asked him, if we can exchange jerseys and he gladly obliged. He seemed like a good guy. Yeah. <laughs> he was hanging around for to take photos with with my with my son and with other players and you know, you were everybody they were all they could have gone in the changing room and, and go and sit there because but they they, they stick there around just to take photos and exchange jerseys and it was just an occasion where we can take photos and just meet them. It was just like a meet and greet thing because mm. I don't think there was going to be time for anyone to have a conversation with Messi or Suarez because you wouldn't be having that even that three, four seconds alone with him because then there's someone else who wants to take a picture. So I think um, they, they were everywhere were professional. They, they gave us that, um, that time. That we can take some pictures and also exchange jerseys. There is a huge debate about if there is money in South African football. Uh, we both know money can never be enough. But is the money that South African players are making enough to sustain them even after they've retired? Yeah, obviously. <coughs> sorry. Obviously, um, everybody knows football players get well played well and obviously it's it's what you do with your money um because like you said money is never enough because you have your billionaires millionaires they're still working still flying to different countries working looking to invest you know this and that so at the end of the day you know no matter how much you earn and it's my philosophy whether it's one rand or earning five rand it's what you do with the money it's mm -hmm. How you work around it, um, what avenues you go into, how you 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 equip yourself with the knowledge 
to make that money work for you after football or when you decide to retire from your normal job one day, whatever the case may be. So I think, um, wouldn't say just football, but in general is how you look after your money and in how do you put it to good use. Yeah. Mm. So um, you, you played at Sundowns, close to eight seasons. Sundowns is one of the teams that is known to be playing well. It's, it's well documented, but from outside, maybe it's a perception. You guys played at Sundowns, you know better than us. Good bonuses. Youngsters come up, definitely they get paid very well. Is there a program that a team like Sundowns has to say, we're going to pay you this much, here's your financial advisor, or they say, we give you your money, how you use it is, is your problem, but we pay you, we'll pay you as agreed. Is there programs, financial advice on how players must invest and so on, at a team like Sundowns? To be honest, no, I don't think there was no program for where they would have people. I remember there's, there was one lady from Sunlam who was there, but I think that that was it. Um, I think um, they should have this more on a regular basis just to bring people in and maybe have like a workshop on financial advice, financial guidance, you know, different projections, different, you know, and educate the youngsters and not just the youngsters, but everybody. Because I think um, even if you're older, you can maybe make a mistake or two mm -hmm. and invest probably in the wrong things, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that is something that we can improve on. Um, I think that we should improve on and not just I think South Africa as a whole, um, where we have this um, incorporated, where you tell the player, listen here, this is your span of football. And after those years, you still have your whole life ahead of you. And we need to equip you with the financial advice, guidance, the wisdom, so that you can also make up your own mind as well. Because someone can only give you advice so that and you know, I say they can can take the horse to the water, but can't make him drink it. Mm -hmm. So I think it needs to be a norm where they encourage players, even before they join this the professional setup, mm -hmm. um, about money and advice and about investing and obviously life after your football days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I had a conversation with former players. I'll mention three names. I spoke to Bennett Chen and the former Orlando Pirates. I spoke to Bati Zotwan, former Mamelodi Sundowns. I spoke to Peter Hovan, the former Super Sport United. There's one thing they said, both of them, which was common. They said, uh, white players and colored players, they seem to manage nightlife or off the pitch life better than African brothers. What's, what's your view on that? Obviously, I can only speak on my personal experience. And I think when, when I came to Sundowns, I knew I, I was going to be alone here, but I, because my wife was working in Cape Town. Mm. And we came to, I just, just said that she should come with, mm. and because you know, when you're on training, maybe have a bad day or whatever, you you come back to, maybe you're coming back to an empty house, but you need people around you maybe to talk to whatever. And then you should have your wife there, you know, a family, whatever the case may be. So that's what I had when I came here. I brought my, my wife was here and she relocated with me. And then I had that sense of family, mm. you know, and when you had a bad day, you come home, you can talk to someone. When you go out, you go for dinner with your wife, you know, you can rub this thing. And I think that was it. It was more about a family thing because now you find yourself alone. Mm. And now when you're alone, now you, your friend starts calling, you know, 
And that's when you fall in the trap about, hey, let me go see what they're doing. Mm. And now your friends may be busy with A, B, and C. And then automatically you get, you get sucked into it. You get fall into the trap, you know, mm. and because they probably not professional football. Maybe they, they have a job Monday to Friday and mm. it doesn't need their body. And they say, Oh, they going, they all going to the club. Mm. And now you're alone at home and the next thing you know, you, you probably, you're almost like you're obliged to go. You, you force yourself. Okay. Let me go. Yeah. And that's when you get hooked. Yeah. And I think so. If you don't have that stability at home, I think I want to worry to say, Hey, you train tomorrow. Hey, and you know, because footballers, they use the body. Yeah. And if you don't sleep properly, you, you using alcohol, obviously you, you're killing the body and you need your body to, to make a living and to provide for your family. And I think, um, that is on my side. I was fortunate. I had my family and always there with me when, when things weren't going well, when it was going well, you know, to celebrate with them. And so I never, I never got attracted to this nightlife, hotel call, you know, those sort of things. Mm. So I was probably one of the lucky ones. Yeah. But the point you mentioned, but you also mentioned to say, color players, when they move from Cape and come to Durban, the first thing they do, they move with their wives. Mm. And he said it helps. So now you're just continuing what he said. And he also said, get settled at the, at the early age if it's possible. It's not a must, but if you happen that you turn pro and you're already settled, you're a family man, it also makes life easy. It grounds you better. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, obviously, because now you settle, you have your wife, you have a kid, whatever. Now, you know, you need to make sure that they are taken care of. You need to make sure that they are good, you know? Mm. So it's, it's your responsibility to, to provide. And you read these things, you hear about, um, how players go out by the back door and why it happened, what happened. So at the end of the day, it's your own intelligence as well. Um, yeah. and the people around you also to, to advise you. Hey, don't go there, you know, because you might end up being hooked in that and that. So you get that sense of responsibility that hey, I need to provide for my family because you brought them now to a different environment away from their own family, probably in Cape Town, whatever the case. So yeah, I think that that was on my side mm. where I, I thought that hey, I need to, in order for me to provide and look after them as best. I need to look after myself as well and do the proper things, get the proper steps in place so that we can have a, a long and successful stay in Johannesburg. Yeah. yeah. You, you played eight seasons at Sundowns. You played with different players, different characters, different youngsters in order. Have you ever been in a training session and you can smell that my teammate has been drinking last night? Without mentioning names, just an experience to say, yes, it happened that you can feel the boy has been drinking. And as a senior player, would you, would you talk him aside or what would it be in a situation where you, you can sense something like this is happening to a particular player? Yeah, obviously, they, they obviously there were a few occasions. And obviously, you, the way we did it there, we, we spoke to the captain and the vice captain. We had like a, a committee. Like all the senior players, but then you also not just senior players, and you maybe take a player that's also a junior coming up, you know, that he can also see, and also when when he gets older, you can also see what's happening. Mm. So then we will obviously um, address the issue and internally first, and then speak to the player about this and that, and because at the end of the day. If he, if he doesn't bring his A game, at the end of the day, the team is going to suffer. Mm. And then you yourself are going to suffer as well. Because maybe the team is not doing well, then everybody's going to say, hey, this, the sundowns is, you know, yeah. the team suffers. So at the end of the day, you're messing with my job as well. So we will obviously address it. And if things goes a bit further, and then that's when we will address management. And then, and I think, that was a thing that we had at Sundowns. We, we didn't put things under the mat. When you as a player, you see something that's, it's not okay. Um, we address it 
as soon as possible. And if it still keeps persisting and then it goes to the coaches or management and then from there, they should know how to deal with it. And yeah. Yeah. yeah because often we'll see, we'll hear coach Peter saying, I need a quiet dressing room. And, yeah. he, and he will drop me to say, I've got Kennedy, I've got Wayne, I've got Diane, I've got Trump. And sometimes we'll misunderstand. What does it mean when you say you need a quiet dressing room? Mm. Yeah, it's, when he says that, it's like he needs to know that everybody is okay in the dressing room. Mm. People is not in limbo about, um, maybe they feel they, why are they not playing, you know? And then we as senior players, we obviously, we encourage and also sort out your small issues, whether it's like you probably need a time off from training. Maybe you need it to be, there's family issues, maybe with your wife or whatever, your son is not feeling well, mm. you know, and then you would probably address it with the captain and the coach and then everything is, it's not a big thing because we speak about it and the coach knows about it. So the players sometimes feel comfortable speaking to KK or Kennedy, you know, or the senior players. And they say, listen, I have, I have this problem. And, and then we help them, you know, and to guide them. Okay, this and that and that. So that you know that there's no issues because now this player might sit there in the corner and come to training every day, but no one knows there's an issue. Mm. But he probably just speaks to that one, mm. you know, and then, and that's how we, 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 we get to deal, help him with these problems that he's going through, you know, and so just different types of things and to bring calm in the changing room and also bring that sense of that. If you don't want to speak to the coach, you can speak to your senior players and, you know, yeah. so that things get sorted and no one is sitting in a dressing room with a, with an issue above the head or, you know, Mm. Yeah. Now, December 2020, when Arense beats Mamelo de Sundowns, what happened and how did we beat Sundowns? Yeah, obviously, uh, people come and go, obviously. And obviously, when they say that um, I need to leave, um, obviously, they're, they're bringing in more younger players, you know. You understand that the younger generation needs to come through and all that. And yeah, I was, I was professional about the whole thing. Um, um, never gave them problems. I said, no, no problem. It's fine. We, everybody will move on because obviously, um, I knew what I brought to Sundowns and what I achieved. Mm -hmm. And obviously I thought that time I can, I can rub some off somewhere else as well. Mm -hmm. And I thought that, um, I maybe, this opens a door, another door for another career or another avenue that I want to go into. Mm. Obviously, um, I looked at, I um, still want to play and give back where I can. And yeah, everything was, it was smooth and no issues because in the day I knew that they also needed to, to build for a new generation and getting fresh players, younger players so that they can adapt to the system up to the culture of sundowns and yeah um i'm very, very grateful um we're still in contact um and still was it the, the recent launch of sundowns and yeah it's, everything is still okay and obviously where i am at my career now so looking to give back mm -hmm. to the to the youngsters and can only get better from there yeah so, so, but when, when they released you, were you consulted? Were you calling a meeting by management or coaches? Or how did you learn that you are no longer part of the team moving forward? Yeah, obviously the management called me in and he said, obviously, um, they're getting in new players and obviously the registration and looking at younger players. And I spoke to the coach as well. Um, I said, no, okay, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, because if, if someone tells you that you, they're not in, you're not in the plans and obviously there's nothing you can do. I mean, you can stand on top of your head. It's, you're not going to change your mind. Mm. And I just, I took it as professionally because I, I knew that when you start playing at say 20, you knew that they will come where you move on, you move to one club, you move to another club, whatever the case. Mm. So I was said, okay, it's fine. Um, 
And I spoke to the coach and he said, okay, we, we need to bring in um, more players and obviously they also need to adapt and all that and the numbers is too big and you know, so now they're releasing a few players and unfortunately my name was there and I said, okay, I understand. Um, and we move on. And yeah, yeah I told my wife, let's see the situation that uh, is now at. Um, I'm going to look for another team and yeah, we move on and we still have that good relationship. And I think um, that was just my personality because um, I was at Santos for years and I moved to Sundowns, no issue. And I moved from Sundowns, no issue. So yeah. because that's just who I am and the personality that's with me. And yeah, I'm very grateful. Yeah. But well, the, the great thing is, is to hear that you still have a good relationship with Mamelodi Sundowns because you won a lot there, you played mm. most years there. And, and since you left Sundowns, there have been talks that uh, you are joining Team A, you are joining Team B. And I look at you when you're still in a good condition. You can walk mm. into the pitch any day and, and still play. Mm. Your body still tells me there's more years in you to give to football. Mm. Apparently, we're going to Swallows. What happened with the Swallows move? Yeah, obviously, you you just read about these things in the in the paper, and obviously, I uh, I wasn't opposed to anything because you already know that there's rumors this one going. But that's why I said I wasn't consulted by any team mm. who said they <coughs> they would love to have uh, services. So so those things never materialized, but it was there that they were interested and not. But it never came to my attention where people would say, listen, phone me or have a meeting to say, listen, we're interested. Mm. Can we do something or whatever? It never materialized that in that way. Um, obviously I, I wanted to still, want to still join another team because I still feel that I can, there's still something I can contribute, mm. um, on and as well as off the pitch mm. because, you know, sometimes it, you don't just give on the pitches what you can bring to the team as well. Um, whether it's leadership skills, um, the experience, you know, guiding the gu youngsters in different direction, pulling him in and, you know, because it was like that for me when I started. I was in the, in the changing room with Idris Burton. I was a roommate at the stage, um, you know, and you see what they're doing as senior players and it just rubs off and, mm -hmm. The same thing as with the sundowns. You see what these guys are doing because that time you were youngster. Now you see your experienced players mm. and you know how they do things, you know, and it just gives you that drive. Mm. So that's why I say for me, I'm still out there looking for a team, um, obviously. And it's about giving back. It's just to give back to the, to the club that, that I'm going to be at and also to the youngsters. Because at the end of the day, it just helps the team and it helps the club. Yeah. You think at the moment, because there's no doubt about your quality and what you can do. You think it's an issue of price tag or teams are scared that you are coming from sundowns, you are definitely expensive. I think that's, I don't know if it's uh, the mentality that teams have, but like I said, probably in my case, it's, it's not the case. Um, for me, I, I always said, I told my agent, listen, uh, if there's a team interested, I'm available. And whatever they probably put on the table, uh, nine out of 10, I will join them because it's not about making money for me. It's about going to another in team, another environment to give back what I've achieved over the years at Sundowns, just to, to help the youngsters also who's never been in the in in environment like sundowns you know or your top teams and just to guide and tell them listen here this is how we did things there and you need to look after your game and not just on the pitch but well off the pitch conduct yourself in a professional manner it's, for me it's about just giving back so that the players there the youngsters can also grow you know mm. and also rub off from the stories that probably they want to ask me, how was it in the Champions League when you guys played the final, you know? Mm. Make them also want to achieve playing in the Champions League. Mm. Make this thing like 
hey, I want to win the league and rub off where you can. So that's what I say for me, it's just about giving back and it's me about, it's not about the money. It's I've made the money already. So it's about, about joining a team and giving back to South African football. Mm. So if, if, if do, we're not going to be particular to Mamelodi Sundowns. I'm going to ask Brought in, 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 in South African teams, mm. because now you've left Sundowns. Um, I will say we take Sundowns of the equation. We talk of the 15 teams that are in the PSL and then the 16 that are in the North Africa. Do you think they still value experienced players, especially when they're 30 plus? I'm asking these questions because I'm going to mention three players who've achieved a lot, but they, are, they don't have teams at the moment. Mm. You see yourself, Wayne Arends, Strong Potekan, you see Mkwe Shabala, mm. experienced guys, but they don't have teams and they said we are available. Is it a matter of teams they don't value experienced players or what is the issue with South African football and age? Yeah, obviously I'm, I can do experiences firsthand now. Um, I think there's a thing about, like you said, when you reach 30 plus, um, they no longer regard you as as an asset. Mm. And I think um, it's important to have your senior guys in the changing room, on the pitch, you know, just to to give that feedback to the youngsters who always probably you have your youngsters probably watch Kakana playing, watching him in Bafana jersey, Shabalala you mentioned. So now they see this guys are here in the same changing room as me. He can only rub off from the experiences and hopefully he, the youngster wants to achieve what Shaba achieved, KK achieved, you know. So I think um, teams need to look at it in a wide perspective, not just about, um, hey, what is he going to, um, is he going to, are we going to be able to resell him again? And, you know, because now they're looking at, okay, we've signed a 20 year old, whatever we have years with him and then we can sell him off to a bigger team you know about making money or that but at the same time it's about creating that good competitive spirit within the team and also helping the club grow as a as a brand you know because you can always improve um, the youngsters in in different topics whether it's the finance you know helping show them listen you know, I did this and, you know, I was in that situation where I signed my contract and now I have that pressure on me. Mm-hmm. Speak to your parents, you know, there's things like that you can talk to them. And obviously, like I said, you can't buy experience and we have that experience and we can only rub it off. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's like, you know, I said, I don't know what, what is the issue, but if I was a club owner and I have KK available and Shaba, I would definitely bring them in and just to help with the youngsters that you have, currently have mm-hmm. and just help with the team. Mm-hmm. True. Um, there's something that I'm thinking is very interesting and I want you to share your experience so that remember the part of the show is to educate and advise the upcoming and current players. Mm-hmm. We haven't had a team for a year, so I'll say the whole of 2021 you were not playing, meaning you don't have an income. How did you manage to keep it together? Because most players, six months without a team, it, you start seeing the cracks. Mm. But how did you get it right? Yeah, obviously, I, in my playing career, you know, you, I started putting, you put money away, you investing in this and that. Um, I invested in property. Um, I had a, I had a love for property because I don't know. It's because when I saw my father, he, he, they bought the second place in Cape Town when I was still young and I was there. I used to help, you know, help mix the, the cement and that. Mm-hmm. And you see, I just love to see how people bowl in it and I become, liking of property um i went that route um there's different avenues you can go into mm-hmm. but i just enjoy the, the property market because i can remember i bought 
my first property um, when I was at Santos. Today it's double the price, and you you just get shocked and you see hey, this uh, this property thing now. It's, it's an asset because your money you you're buying the property, but your money is still there. That it's, it's still the asset, and your money still gets more, you know, because mm -hmm. the, the it, it just goes up. The property just goes up. It doesn't depreciate. It just increases. So yeah, that's what kept me going. Obviously, uh, um, started a business or investment company, and that's where I'm at now. And investing in different properties, mm -hmm. um, different projects, and, and that, that sort of thing. Yeah. So you've got a couple of properties that you are renting out and they are bringing income while yeah. Uh, yeah. looking Yeah, I have a few here in Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. I, I never saw me buying in Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. I was a Cape Town boy. Um, I bought in Cape Town. I bought here in Johannesburg as well. So yeah, just looking at different markets because at the end of the day, you also learn because obviously I didn't know anything also because you were just looking at videos, looking at um, how people are doing it, asking advice. Hey, how can you do this? Is it beneficial for me? Mm. And what are the advantages, the disadvantages? You can only equip yourself to those sorts of things. And I think um, that's what I did. Yeah. And it's helping me. It's, um, it's sustaining me. And mm. obviously, um, it's not to say that that's where it's at. Obviously, I'm still looking at different avenues, whether it's playing, whether mm -hmm. it's in the coaching field, but obviously in football because obviously I've been in football but over my whole life yeah. from a youngster, district football, right up to professional. So I, I still see myself within the football, in the fraternity. And also, I'm at another end on the property side of things. Mm -hmm. So... Like I said, you need to equip yourself. You can listen to seminars, go on YouTube, listen to people's stories and see. And then afterwards, you just test the waters and see hey, this thing is working. And luckily for me, it's been working so far. It's, it's still going smoothly, so yeah. I can only improve. Yeah. And what role did your agent play in your career? Are you still using the same agent or you change agents along your career? <laughs> no, I had one agent, Ronald Santos, and still have the same one. Because yeah. at the end of the day, you, you end up as not just about the agent, but as a personal relationship you have. And you also hear what he has to say and what is he saying, you know. And then you also pick up to say, okay, no, this guy is also looking at the best interest of me and he's looking out for me, you know. He also advises me to, yeah pump it in the property, you know. So worst case scenario, if things doesn't go your way, you have this property, you know, you can still get capital gain there, you know, those sort of things. So it was the agent as well. He was also there. And let's just say you, you need to surround yourself with positive people and, you know, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, positivity it rubs off. And so... When you surround yourself with those type of people, then they you be end up you ending up yourself with what you surround yourself with. Yeah. So when you we are about to wrap up, and at the moment you're still looking for a team. As, yeah. as I I just witnessed that you you're in great condition, you can still play. Besides uh, hoping to finish few years playing, what are your current projects and future projects that you want to embark on? Yeah, like you said, I was looking still to play and still keeping fit and hopefully something comes up. Obviously, um, we're still doing the flatlets, uh, construction thing. So that's basically at the market where I'm at now, mm. where you build bachelor units mm. and you, you rent those things out. It generates income and there's, it's just a cycle. Yeah. Um, when you build, you get tenants, and then with that money, you you go over the next one, and it's just it's just a cycle that keeps going. Yeah. So it's it's a non-stop process, but obviously um, you need to know what you're getting yourself into. Like I said, surround yourself with the proper people. If you know you're gonna do 
construction. You need to, as an understand with an architect, engineer, a builder, a plumber, you need to listen to everybody and that's how you get the bigger picture. Mm. So, as I say, it doesn't matter whether you in that business or you in a fashion, whether a, fa a label you want to start with, you need to surround yourself with the people that knows these things, you know. So, like I say, for the people out there, the youngsters coming up that wants to put their money probably in, in different avenues. For me, I would say get different, get advice, um, read about the things that you want to do, um, speak to people, um, not just one, but speak to two, three people so that because you will always hear the, the, the dominant thing comes out in, in any topic, yeah. you know? So, as I say, like, speak to people, get their knowledge, and yeah, and look after yourself, and not just within your playing career, but also after. Yeah. And in terms of cars, how many cars did you own? Because footballers are known for fast, big cars. Uh, me, I just have two cars, it's one, not my car. One is my wife's, mm -hmm. because she drops the kids and um, fetches the kids and whatnot. And I have one where I used to go to work and that was it because I didn't see the need for three, four cars because why? Because the cars just can take you to A to A from point A to B. So for me, I'm, I was a basic guy. Um, I bought myself a bucky. Mm. I still have, I have the bucky um, because I knew why I'm buying the bucky because I'm in the construction part of things. So. Where I need it, because you always need a bucket in those situations. And my wife has a car, so she picks up the kids. So, as I say, because in the end of the day, you're buying the car for 10 ren. As soon as it leaves the floor, it's, it's worth 8 ren. Mm. Next year, it's worth 6 ren. So, mm. it just goes down. So, the car is just there. Obviously, you want a nice car. You need to spoil, your, spoil yourself as well, but not your Maserati's and your, yeah. you know. So, but, like I said again, surround yourself with positive people, get the proper information, mm. and yeah, and mm. hopefully that you'll do well for yourself. Yeah. Okay, lastly, I want to say, let's assume you're a brother or a manager to a particular player who's going to get a lump sum of signing on fee in a month or six months from now, or he's going to move from small team to a big team, the salary is going to increase from 20 rand to 50 rand. What advice would you give to that particular player to say, if you get a huge money jump or a lump sum, as if I were your brother or your father or your manager, I'll say this to you about this money. Yeah, obviously, if, like I said, if I was a manager, whatever, like you're not saying, if someone gets five rand and automatically he, he sees a new contract with Tenerent. He's been living with Fiverr all the time. I would tell him, listen, you're not going to even touch that other, probably other four rand. Just give him the six rand because you were coping all along with five rand. Give him the six rand and keep the four rand and put it in the clause like this four rand is going, um, in investment account or you want to invest this in property or, but it's not coming to your account, mm. you know? You need to, so that he can also have that sense of um, looking off, you're looking after him, but you want to help him also look after his own money mm. and engage with him in that sense, like that you are okay now, you don't need this, let's put it away for after, you know? Mm. And also, you need to, need to show him, like listen here, this is what I'm going to do with your money. At the end of the day, this 10 RN will be worth 30 RN after 10 years and show him the bigger picture. Yeah. Because some, some people will say, no, invested there. Mm. But then he say, why? And then you say, no, you can earn this interest, but everybody don't understand the same language. Mm. So it's, it's an educational thing, but also a benefit to the player as well. Yeah. So make him understand that when you sign your next contract, you're not signing the 10 RN, you're only signing for 6 RN. Mm. But because that other four end is going in different avenues. So when you do it, um, re retire one day, whatever, end up hanging up your boots and then you know you have access to all those funds. 
And I think that's, that's one thing that we should do in South Africa. Yeah. Um, I remember having this conversation with an, the late Anele, Nona. Mm-hmm. I think they have it in Belgium, where they take a percentage of your money. The, they keep it in, the, in a fund or a trust. The day that you say you retire, that, that percentage comes back to you and you left with probably millions. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a good thing because then you're also more older and more experienced in life. And now you also have money. Mm-hmm. So now you, if you didn't start before, then you can always, you have a second chance to start. So I think we should start that in the, in South Africa where when people sign the con- first contract, it should be a percentage of that going in another fund or, or in different investments. Yeah. That's a very interesting clause that it, it can help. But do you think it must be applied from SAFA level, PSL, club level, or the players agent? Who would be the best person to implement this clause? I think the, the players agent, we, we start there and because at the end of the day, you have a relationship with that player. Mm. And if it was me, I would, I'm signing a youngster. I even sit his parents down, everything, and I, I lay out the vision, everything, and show them because at the end of the day, the parents only want what's good for, for the, the, this children. Yeah. So obviously, it will always start with someone you have a closer relationship to. And because you're entrusting, if I sign with you, I'm trusting you to, to look after me and get teams, you know, and those sort of things. So I think it should start there, but also it will be implemented at your highest level as well. Your SAFA, so it will become a norm. So that they say, hey, if they sign, but your percentage goes there and, you know, so your agent also has a role to play and say, no, that is a good thing. And, you know, mm. because he also does his research and he can relate to you and tell you this and that. And I think it will work. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much, Wayne. Um, I really enjoyed our conversation, and I'm of a view that players, uh, anybody who watches this, they will learn a lot because your your advices and what you've learned is not only for football players. Even a youngster who just turned pro at work, or if you can learn a lot from you to say invest on the right things, use your money wisely, look after yourself, and look after your body. Um, I really appreciate you visiting us and. Um, I don't know if you could anything to say before we close. Yeah, it was the, um, like you said before, it's, it's just not what you do on the pitch, but off the pitch as well, because when you become a professional, you're a public figure, people see you everywhere. So you need to conduct yourself in a professional manner. And because you must know what you do, it replicates someone else as well, because that youngster will maybe look up to you. You won't even know, but he's probably looking up to you. So know that there's someone always watching and just be professional and get advice. Um, always work on your craft and yeah, just be humble, be professional and take care of yourself. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Wayne. As I said, humble guy. Gentle giant, those defenders who are gentle giants, uh, they will deal with you, but in a gentle way. So we've seen what is done on the pitch and we've helped him off the pitch. And from me, TK, um, this is a wrap. Until we meet on the next episode, thank you very much. Continue to subscribe, continue to share the channel and add comments. Until we meet again, thank you very much. It's a bye-bye from me.